Hey guys, this is going to be chapter 29. Before I start, if you liked the previous chapter, chapter 28, with the subtitles that was ge generated by AI, uh, let me know. This video is not going to have that. It's just going to be me reading. Chapter 29. And if you want more AI generated subtitles, let me know. And I'll do that. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Please like this video if you're finding value in this book series. And you also might give me, give me a tip as well. Once upon a time, a farmer lived in the middle of a forest full of baboons, began Nam Ho. It was late at night. Her, her nerves wouldn't let her sleep. So she decided to tell mother a story. Nam Ho hugged the grass-filled grain bag and she had mother's jar nestled next to her face. She knew the leopard wouldn't be a problem until he finished eating the kudu, but he was still out there. The farmer could never relax, she went on. Day after day, the baboons looked hungrily at, at his mealies, but every time they tried to get them, the farmer would pelt them with rocks from his sling. Finally, the, baboon, the, the chief baboon said, my brothers, we are never going to get those mealies. That man is too is much too watchful. He can make mistakes though. He never guards the goat pen because he doesn't know we can eat meat. Hoo hoo! cried all the other animals. Let's go raid the goat pen. They killed a goat and roasted its meat. Do you know what would be really funny? suggested the chief baboon. Let's sow our droppings into the skin and prop it up outside the farmer's hut. Woohoo! Wow, what a great idea, cried the other animals. They filled the skin with baboon droppings and sewed it up and propped it against the farmer's door. Then they hid, then they hid in the bushes to watch. Soon the farmers came out. Good morning, my fine nanny goat. What are you doing out of your pen? The goat didn't answer. Well, don't stand there blocking the door. Get out of the way, said the farmer. But the goat didn't answer. The man shouted at the animal. And then, when it still didn't answer, he lost its temper and kicked it. Ah! The stitches flew apart. The goat skin exploded and sent baboon droppings all over the hut. The farmer was furious. Ah, ah, cried the baboons, falling all over themselves with laughter. I'll get them back for that, the man said as he swept and washed out his hut. He dug a deep pit in front of his garden and covered it with branches. Then he lay down on the trail to the forest and pretended to be dead. The baboons discovered him. They pushed and prodded him. He didn't move. They sang, The farmer is dead, hi. What has killed him, hi. He died of grief for his goat, hi. With what can we repay him, hi. We'll have to bury him, said the chief baboon. So they carried the farmer into the forest and dug a grave. It was hard work, and soon the animals got bored. Who cares if hyenas scattered his bones, said the chief baboon, wiping his face. The, the good thing is, he's no longer around to throw rocks at us. Let's go raid the mealies. The baboons left the farmer and hurried back down the trail. They raced to the garden, fell into the pit, and were all killed. The farmer lived happily ever after and never had to worry about his plants again. Namho hugged the grain bag and listened to the sounds in the night. She heard the usual mutter of the baboons. They couldn't be too worried or they wouldn't talk. It's going to be more difficult to finish the boat now, mother said. I should have put it off, moaned Namho. There's always something dangerous in the forest. You'll just have to be more careful. I can't work with that creature around. You don't have a choice, Mother pointed out. The waves are as big as elephants during the rainy season. 
said Crocodile Guts from a soft bed in the Juzu village. Namho got up and sat on the edge of her platform. She watched the star starlit cliff with its murmuring baboons until dawn. As she had hoped, the meat dried steadily during the night. It hadn't spoiled. As soon as the baboons were gone, Namho built up the curing fire. Clouds of smoke billowed up through gaps in the platform, adding flavor as well as preserving the meat. Now and then she turned the strips to expose both sides. I can't possibly work on, on the boat until this is finished, she explained to Mother. Then to keep from feeling guilty, Namho devised a method to protect her stores. She took two of the now useless fish traps, plugged the small ends, and hung them from hung them by long ropes from the highest branch of the lucky bean trees. The branch extended out of the grass out over the grassland. She could pull the fish traps back by 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 means of a string. I can store the meat inside, my. The birds can't reach it, and the baboons can't jump that high. To be on the safe side, Namho built a low fire on the ground below. If Rumpy tried anything, he was going to get a hot foot. In the middle of the day, Namho made a quick trip for water. The stream was dry now, and she had to depend on the lake. She put the panga on the sling with the calabashes and kept the spear handy. She half intended to raid the kudu carcasses again, but when she got to the shore, the antelope was gone. All of it. The leopard must have dragged it into a tree, she thought. The rock looked perfectly clean, though, without a trace of blood. Or perhaps there was blood. Namho was too unnerved to check closely. In the afternoon, she packed the fish traps with dried meat and suspended them from the overhanging branch. Well satisfied. She went to the stream to gather a few blackjack leaves for relish. The stream was dry, but a cool dampness still clung to the soil. Hoo! The sound brought her instantly alert. The baboons were, were back early, and they had almost silent and they had come almost silently. Suddenly they were all around her in a milling crowd. It wasn't the chaotic screeching mob she was used to. The animals slipped through the grasslands like the vervet monkeys near the leopard, leopard cave. Even Tag was impressed with the seriousness of it. He rode on, donk on Donkey Berry's back without a single murmur. Namho shivered. The males were unusually irritable. They, s they snapped at one another and threatened the females. Now that the troops were close to the sleeping cliff, the animals spread out and applied themselves to digging to the, in the soil. That in itself was unusual. At the end of the day, the baboons preferred social activities, grooming, entertaining infants, lounging in, in, the, in the friendly groups. They were clearly ravenous. Something had kept them from feeding. Rumpy sniffed around the, smoke, the smoking platform, barking as, a coal, as coal singed his nose. He spotted Namho and trotted up fur bristling to, to demand the meager bunch of blackjack leaves. Go away, shouted Namho. Rumpy slapped the ground. She snatched up a stone and hurled it accurately at his head. Rumpy danced back and forth with fury. He didn't cower as he usually did when, when she hit him. She suddenly realized he was dangerous. She grabbed the spear, which was lying against the thorn barrier, and quickly unhooked the ladder as it flopped down. She thrust the spear at the angry creature to drive him back. Rumpy sprang forward instead. He sent Namho crashing to the ground as he rushed to grab the ladder. He smashed, his foot smashed her face into the dirt. By the time she recovered, he was already on the platform, ragging or raging through her possessions. His big teeth crunched into, into calabashes to get at the food inside. But what he really wanted, and could obviously smell, was the meat. He hopped from branch to branch. He caved in the delicate, smaller platforms. He found the fish traps hanging from the rope, but he couldn't reach them. The branch was too slender, and he didn't have the sense to pull them in with the string. 
Rumpy bounced up and down in the tree in a perfect fit of, of rage. Meanwhile, Namho had grabbed a burning branch from the fire. She was terrified, but her survival deepened, depended on protecting her stores. She swung up the ladder and shoved the flames into Rumpy's face. He flinched back. She clambered around him, trying to drive him out of the tree. Rumpy was beginning to lose his nerve. Namho approached him like a small and utterly reckless honey badger. She screamed insults. She, she cursed his ancestors. She felt like she wouldn't mind sinking her teeth into his throat. Ah! shouted Rumpy. He dodged past her. His twisted foot stumbled against Mother's Jar, and he fell with a shriek over the edge of the platform. Mother's Jar rolled after him before Namho could, could reach it. It smashed open, and the, pic and the picture, caught in the, in the afternoon breeze, breeze from the lake, fluttered off and landed in the cook fire. Namho almost fell out of the tree in her haste. She ignored the fallen animal as she raced for the picture. The same puff of wind that had blown it away stirred the coals in the fire. They flared up briefly, caught the paper, and burned it to, to ashes before Namho even got close. She knocked the coals aside with her bare hands, ignoring the searing pain in her fingers. But it was already too late. The picture blew away like the ashes that had um, been beaten in the mortar so long ago in the village, the day Vatete died. Ambuya, they whispered. Sister Chipo, Masvita, beloved Namho, please do not be frightened. I must go now. I know you will follow when you can. The ashes floated off on the wind, carrying the message. Hey, you guys, if you've enjoyed this reading, please give me a like. I would appreciate it or a tip or subscribe. Help me get to 5,000. I would appreciate it. And click on the link for chapter 30. Thank you so much.